Hello everybody, welcome to number 27. And today I am here with a Golf Mark IV GTI. Now this might seem like a little bit of an unusual choice for me because, well, they don't have the reputation for being the best Golf GTIs out there. In actual fact, a lot of people th seem to think that they are the worst, including perhaps the chairman of VW at the time, Bernard Pirschner, who said that it was too average too slow and that it was a perfect example of where marketing had had too much leeway in the design of a car. So today I'm going to take it for a drive and find out are they really quite as bad as people say? After all, all the modern GTIs are uber sharp and everyone's always saying how the older cars were more comfortable, more flowing. Perhaps this has now changed in appreciation. One of the biggest problems that the Mark IV faced at the time was that the competition was pretty stiff, especially in the form of this. The 306, um, first in XSI S16 form, but really the best form of all was the GTI 6, which was out, I'm pretty sure, by the time that this was launched. Not only did it have more power than these, um, but the handling was absolutely brilliant, and it had a six-speed box, which at the time was an incredible feature. Now, the other big problem is when this was launched originally with the eight valve engine, it, it came out with 125 horsepower. That's not enough for a GTI, let alone one that weighs considerably more than the car that it replaced. So as a result, it was deemed to be too slow and it just you know, wasn't supposed to feel like a performance car. Afterwards, they slotted in the 1.8 turbo engine, which brought power up to 150, which is this car here. And that did make a difference. At least it gave the GTI the performance to back up the GTI badge. Those cars, funnily enough, had the little eye in red on the back. But the problems that the Mark IV faced were really more substantial than simply increasing power. Before we get into that though, one of the things which, because this is quite important I think for the story of what happened with this car is, one of the things that was absolutely incredible was the quality of the interior, but the exterior too. You know, the panel gaps, the paint finish, those crystal clear lights, it just, when it came out, I remember seeing it at the Earl's Court show in London, and it was just, I think it was Earl's Court, it was just a revelation. The interior quality, and then those blue lights, which at the time, I'm telling you, were incredibly swish, seriously upmarket. You know, apparently it was benchmarked against an S-Class for interior quality and comfort. But anyway, the interior was stupendous. And just to give you one of the really silliest examples of how far they went down this route, even these grab handles are damped. How ridiculous is that? Who's gonna notice that? You know, 2% of the people using this car? And yet, they designed that into them. It, it's just mental. So the lengths they went to make a quality high-end product did make sense because at the time, Volkswagen were slowly moving up market. Also, the previous Golf GTIs never really won the tests from being the outright best performers, best handlers. They won the tests because they were the best all-rounders. When you combine those two things, I think it shows you what was going on at VW at the time and why they made this mistake of making a GTI that, quite frankly, wasn't really worthy of the name. And I think that the thing is that, A, they'd be moving up market, B, this car was all about being up market, C, they used to win tests for being the most usable, best all-rounders. And I think VW thought, look, the performance angle isn't really the most important thing with the Golf GTI because of the brand and the way it is. We don't need to worry about you know, how rewarding it is to drive as much. Let's just make it fairly rapid and a very nice place to be in. They thought that was enough. 
course it wasn't. It was absolutely panned on release. The 1.8 versions with the turbo did address the fact that the, those original cars were really very little more than, I didn't even know if we'd call them a warm hatch. It was a good car, but it wasn't, it wasn't a GTI, it wasn't a sports hatch. The higher performance, 150 horsepower, at least gave it a little bit of oomph, but it still left the biggest problems unresolved. The chassis had incredible, an incredible range of movement. It was way too soft. Over undulations, the car would move around a lot, way too much. Generally speaking, the steering was quite wooden, quite dead. The gear change was unremarkable. It's a little bit bulky, um, a bit long. But essentially, it wasn't a bad car, it just wasn't a GTI. But what is it like to drive one today? Perhaps time has been kind to it. Now, initial impressions are that they do feel quite... The steering, the steering isn't brimming with feedback. It's a little bit cumbersome, the whole car. Now, this has an incredible 200 and... Where is it? 237,000 miles on it. So as you can appreciate, a few things have been changed, including the suspension. And you can see me bouncing around because it has key KWV1s. Um, obviously, when he had to change the suspension, he decided to go for the KW option rather than the standard shocks. But this still has torsion beam at the rear. So it's quite a primitive setup, really. Struts at the front, I think. But my 306 still has torsion beam at the rear and struts at the front, and it is absolutely amazing. I think that this was all about comfort. It was all about isolating you from the road. So the suspension on this already makes a big difference. To be honest, for me in a car like this, it controls it a lot better, but it's... Uh, it just doesn't deal with the bumps as well. Let's do a quick pull and see how the engine feels and does. So this is the 1.8. Now I remember driving one of these before and it felt suitably quick it wasn't mega quick this has had a very light chipping just to increase torque more than anything but you can feel that again it's perfectly fine really it's it's more than quick enough especially with the chip but what it what it doesn't have is any charisma it doesn't feel you don't enjoy it you don't enjoy revving it really you don't it, you don't have to. In between sort of three and a half and five, there's quite a lot of power there. It's quite, it's not bad, you know, it's quite a fun little car, but I think that it's at the detriment of comfort. Whereas my 306 handles easily as well as this, turns a bit nicer, feels a bit lithe, but it deals with the bumps really well. I think to make this handle, Nick, who owns it, you know, has put this, the KW setup on it, that does definitely make it handle more. It is a better, it is a, it is much more like a GTI, but the ride, for me anyway, is, is unacceptable, really. And if you're on a smooth road, it probably wouldn't bother you as much. On my test route, certainly, it is just way too stiff for what it is. It feels I don't know, it feels almost sort of track car stiff and it goes really against the rest of the ambience of the car. From my memories, I think if you drove a standard one of these, it would be, as described, very, very wallowy. And the ride, although definitely better than it is here, still it couldn't quite deal with bumps and it was shudder over potholes. It wasn't, um, it wasn't that it was just overly biased towards comfort, it's just that I think that this platform had reached its limit. So here, I understand why Nick has done it. He's opted to make it fun at the expense of comfort. And it is actually quite good fun. 
interestingly, because it has this suspension and I suspect it has this mileage, there are quite a few sort of creaks and rattles around which you would not have had in the original cars. So to sum up the Mark IV GTI, what should we say? Well, it's possible to make them handle a lot better. This really isn't that bad. Um, Nick made sure that I switched off the traction control as soon as I got in it before and drove it because he says it cuts in really noticeably. It does, he's right. As it is now, it's got 17s, so there's a bit more rubber there. It isn't as massively prone to understeer as a standard car would be. So I think he's done a lot of improvements and I'm impressed with the mileage. Um, ultimately, I think that history will still judge, judge the Mark IV as a bit of a low point in the GTIs. As a car though, a standard Mark IV, I don't really mind. If you're gonna use it as transport, it's a good car, it really is. And for the time, I mean, the interiors on these are actually better than any subsequent Golf. Yes, some of the later ones looked a little bit flasher, but in terms of quality, the materials, the design as well, it was just, you know, this reached a high point. So if you're not after something that gives you GTI-like emotions, it's a perfectly, it's a very good car. If you want something that does everything better, you can go for a 306. On the flip side of that is that the interior on my 306 really is quite unpleasant. Nowadays, price-wise, if you're gonna buy one of these, you're looking at, um, you're looking almost like for a decent one, almost the same price as a Mark V, which is a far superior car in terms of handling. So you'd really have to like the original concept and the, the sort of upmarket feel that this had to make that worthwhile. If you want me to do a review on your car, then please get in touch, either by email or on Instagram. If you want to see more on my 306 and some tests with that, have a look at this video here. Thank you all so much for watching. Do subscribe if you haven't already, and I really look forward to seeing you for the next video.